الحمد لله نحمد ونستعين ونستغفر ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده جو تو الله ان سچ وي شود پرايز هيم سيك هيز هيلب and seek refuge in Allah from the evil which is within ourselves and the evil which results from our deeds. For whomsoever Allah has guided, none can misguide. And whomsoever Allah has allowed to go astray, none can guide. And I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship but Allah. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last messenger of Allah. In asdaq al-hadith kitabullah indeed the most truthful form of speech is the book of Allah wa khayr hadi hadi Muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the best source of guidance was the guidance brought by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa sharr al-umuri muhdathatuha and the worst of all affairs are the innovations in religion fa inna kull muhdathatin bid'ah wa kull bid'atin dalala وَكُلَّ ضَلَالَةٍ فِي النَّارِ For indeed every innovation in religion is a cursed innovation. And all cursed innovation leads to misguidance. And all misguidance leads to hell. With that, my dear brothers and sisters, we are looking in this khutbah at a continuation of the second pillar of faith, that of belief in the angels. In the previous session, we dealt with belief in the angels in, in depth and the characteristics that we should draw from it and how should it affect our character. In this khutbah, we'll be looking at a connected world, the world connected to the, the world of the angels, and that is the world of the jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about the jinn in the Quran. In fact, we have a chapter of the Quran named the chapter of the jinn. Meaning that it is something important enough that we should have basic and clear knowledge about. And Prophet Muhammad wasallam spoke at length about the world of the jinn. Specifically focusing on how that world affects our world. And it was the duty of the prophets, may God's peace and blessings be upon all of them, to inform human beings about that world which does clash with our worlds at different times. Where people not having clarity on that world are drawn into shirk. Worshipping others besides Allah. Worshipping others along with Allah. Worshipping others instead of Allah. That, in many cases, is a consequence of the interference of that world, the world of the jinn with the human world. And that is why prophets gave clarification about that world. It is enough to say that Prophet Muhammad wasallam told us that at the end of time, when the false Christ would return, would come, claiming to be Jesus and claiming to himself be God, a messenger of God and ultimately God himself, calling people to believe that he is God. The Prophet Wasallam labeled him Al-Masih Al-Dajjal, the Antichrist or the False Christ. Because 
it is known that Christ would return. He would come utilizing that knowledge, exploiting that knowledge that people have and promote himself ultimately to be God. As Jesus became God amongst the Christians, he would become the God of this world for all nations of this world. The prophet, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, explain that one of the things that he would do is that he would challenge people saying to them, if I bring your father and mother back to life, will you believe that I am God? And of course, the people said, yes. If you can bring my father and mother back to life, then I will believe you're God. Because only God can bring life to the dead. Resurrect the dead. And when they say that, two jinns, two from the world of the jinn, would appear before the individual, one looking like his mother and the other one looking like his father. And they will say to him, O oh son, believe in him, accept him, because he is God. And the person will fall down in prostration before the Antichrist. Now, if we don't have knowledge of the world of the jinn, then that's what will happen. If your parents come back to you, somebody brings your parents, what appears to be your parents, back to life, and they tell you, son, we've been there, and we're back to tell you that this man is God. You're going to believe. But if you understand the world of the jinn, then you can't be fooled. And that is why Allah dedicated a chapter in the Quran to the world of the jinn. And he mentions them throughout the Quran, focusing, of course, on the most uh, critical individual amongst them, Satan, whose proper name is Iblis, focusing on him. Because what we're talking about ultimately is the world of the jinn from the perspective of the evil element amongst the jinn. First and foremost, we should know that the jinn, invisible beings, invisible to us under, in their normal state, were created by Allah as the angels were created. They're from Allah's creation. They're not beings that have their own origin or without origin, etc. They are created beings. However, they're invisible to us. As there is a created world that we live in contact with, which we can't see. Because if somebody asked you to show them magnetism, they can't. Magnetism is invisible. The effects of magnetism, we can see. And so on and so forth. There are many things that are invisible to us. Some of the things were, were invisible, and today they are now visible. Microscopes have made what was microscopic and not visible earlier visible today. Telescopes have made what was invisible in the heavens, etc. Part of the invisible world can become visible due to developments in technology. But there's also a part of the visible world which we can never see in its normal circumstance. We'll not be able to see it. And among that is the world of the jinn. Allah created the jinn, as the Prophet ﷺ said, from fire. As he created the angels from light and created the human, me, human beings from earth. That is the origin of creation. But as we explained earlier, the fact that the jinn were created from fire doesn't mean they are fire. Just as we are created from earth, but we're not earth. The angels were created from light, but they're not light. That's just talking about origins. The elements, the created elements from which these creations were made. 
the world of the jinn, creatures who inhabit this world, have a free will like human beings. As distinct from the angels. Angels have no free will. They do whatever Allah has commanded them to do. Now the world of the jinn, therefore, having free will, will have those who believe and those who disbelieve. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was sent to both the world of the jinn as well as the world of human beings. And the earlier prophets also had believers, followers from among the world of the jinn. As is generally held by Muslim scholarship, no messengers were actually sent from among the world of the jinn. Some scholars did hold that messengers were sent because it's their verse in the Quran which could be taken in more than one way. But the general opinion was that they, being in contact with our world, being able to see what is happening in our world, they were able to get the message through the messengers who were sent to human beings. So you have among them believers and you have among them disbelievers. The disbelievers among them, like the disbelievers in this life, seek to create mischief and evil for a variety of different reasons. They, like human beings, are devilish in their behavior, and that's why Allah refers to them as shayateen al-insi wal-jinn. The devils from among the human beings and the jinn. They're in both worlds. And they, in their mischief, may cooperate with individuals from this world to promote their own ends. But control over them, no human being was given except Prophet Sulaiman. Prophet Sulaiman, Allah gave him as his miracle, one of his miracles, control over the jinn. They did as he commanded them. However, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who on one occasion, companions saw him praying, and then he reached out his hand as if he was struggling with something during the prayer, and after the prayer they asked him, what was that, O Messenger of Allah? And he explained that an evil jinn had tried to uh, violate his prayer by pushing what appeared to be like a torch in his face. So he held him at bay. He was able to control him from the perspective of stopping his harm. But he said, I thought to tie him up so that the people of Medina could see him in the morning. However, I remembered the dua of my brother, Prophet Sulaiman, that Allah give him a dominion which he would not give to anyone after him. And he accepted he was not able to do this. To hold him at bay, to keep him off himself, yes. But to control him to the point of tying him up, no. That control was given only to Prophet Sulaiman. So if that's the case for Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu then we must believe that all of the folk stories and folklore and fairy tales that we hear back home about people having control over the jinn know that this is false. That they may be in contact with the jinn may be true. But control, no. Doing the bidding of the jinn, yes. The jinn doing certain things for them, yes. But control, no. Prophet Muhammad Wasallam explained first and foremost the world of fortune telling. Fortune telling where people like to know what's going to happen. Everybody would like to know what's going to happen tomorrow, next year, in the future. 
Because if you know what's going to happen, you can prepare for it. So it's natural. People throughout history have offered explanations or means of explaining the future. These people are called fortune tellers. They use a variety of different ways. Some gaze in a crystal ball. Some read your palm. Some read the tea leaves in the bottom of your cup. Some read the stars. We call it astrology. But all of it in the end boils down to fortune telling. Telling your fortune. Some have even made it into a computer program. There was a program called Biorhythms, which claims to chart, you know, different systems in your body. You punch in your name and your date of birth, and they give you a chart. You know, each one has a, uh, up and a down, you know, three charts. And wherever these three charts intersect, right? These three graphs where they intersect, that is the optimum time to do things. Yeah, that's fortune telling. That's fortune telling. There is no such thing as biorhythms. It's made up. And they're offering you explanations for your future. Now, that whole process, of course, in Islamic terms, is forbidden. Haram. 100%. Prophet Muhammad ﷺ said, whoever goes to a fortune teller, out of curiosity, asks him and listens to what he has to say, then his prayers will not be accepted for 40 days and nights. His prayers will not be accepted for 40 days and nights. Doesn't mean you can say, okay, I will check the fortune teller tomorrow, yesterday, so no need to pray for the next 40 days. No. It doesn't mean that. Right? It means that you are still obliged to pray. When you pray, two things happen. One, you remove the obligation from yourself of prayer. And two, you earn a reward, depending on the quality of your prayer. That's a given for salah. So, the reward for your prayers for the next 40 days and nights are lost. But the obligation for prayer remains. So you still have to pray. Because if you don't pray, then you add the additional sin of abandoning salah. <coughs> and abandoning salah is a form of disbelief. As the Prophet ﷺ had said, الْأَحْدَ الَّذِي بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَهُ الصَّلَاةِ فَمَنْ تَرَكَهُ فَقَدْ كَفَرُ That the distinction between us and the disbelievers is salah. Whoever abandons it has become a disbeliever. So, that's serious. The fact that the Prophet ﷺ would say your salah's value is destroyed for the next 40 days means that this is something very serious. We cannot afford to take it lightly. Meaning if you open up the newspaper or the magazine, and so many of them have your sign. Right? Are you Virgo or Leo or whatever? And you go there and they'll tell you today is a good day to do this. Out of curiosity, you're not, you don't believe in this stuff, but you'd like to see, what is he saying? Right? Out of curiosity, you lost the reward for 40 days and nights. It is that serious. If you read it and believe it, then Prophet ﷺ had said, then you have disbelieved in what I brought in Islam. That's disbelief, an act of disbelief. Of course, you can repent and get yourself back in line, but it's an act of disbelief, so serious. And the Prophet ﷺ explained, because of course that's not quite enough for human beings. Because his own wife, Aisha, asked, what about the things that they tell us which is true? Because you go to the fortune teller, and they tell you some things which come true. Some of them are very famous. They've identified major events in the world, you know. Nostradamus, for example. People who read his writings, etc. He's a fortune teller. And some of his stuff appears to come true. Of course, some of it is wording which is ambiguous, which you can twist to mean anything you want. But in some cases, he has 
identified some particular things. So where does that come from? If they're not, to, if they're to be rejected in totality, how is it then this happens? So the Prophet ﷺ explained the process. He said that when Allah gives a command for something to happen in this world, that command is passed down through the different levels of the heavens, angels passing on to those below them, until it reaches the lowest heaven. And in the course of that information being passed, the angels passing on the information, talking about it to each other, some of the jinn are able to go up to the border of the lowest heavens and are able to hear some of that information, bits and pieces. And they are driven away from it by meteorites, etc., comets, and some of them manage to pass it on down before being themselves destroyed or being knocked. And that information is handed down until it reaches the ear of the fortune teller. And the jinn that the fortune teller works with cackles this into his ear, so on, so on, so on, so on. But, the Prophet ﷺ said, each truth is mixed with a hundred lies. Each truth is mixed with a hundred lies. And it is the nature of people that somebody tells you ten things. One thing occurs. You forget the nine which didn't because that's the nature of your mind, isn't it? You hear information, it goes into your subconscious. When something comes to revive it, bring it back out of the subconscious, that's what you focus on. So you say, ah, that guy was right. He told me what's going to happen. You know, and then you become a promoter, PR man for the fortune teller. Hey, the guy told me, you know. So people will come to this individual. You forgot the nine other things or 90 other things that he told you, which was all nonsense, which didn't happen. You only remember the one thing he told you, which did happen. And that is the nature of that world. Forbidden, cursed, punishable. Connected to that world is the world of magic. Where people perform acts of magic. And these acts are used, now we use it to entertain. We have entertainers who entertain us with magic. And they have in the past. But mostly in the past, that magic was used to win hearts and souls. It wasn't really for entertainment. It was very serious. So though Western civilization has basically turned magic into entertainment, you still have an element amongst them who use it to control and to win over the souls. So you'll have certain, you know, evangelists, like a well-known one by the name of Jimmy Jones, back in the 70s who used to do what was virtually magical acts. People would come to him with cancer, and on stage, he would put his hand in their chest and pull out the cancer. And the person would get up and be healed. Of course, a good bit of it was trickery. But some elements of it were real. And so he had a following. He had a huge following, so much so that they went down from the U.S. to Guyana in South America and they formed a, a colony there and 900 of them committed suicide. Killed themselves. Men, women, and children. 900. Believed in him that much that they would take their own lives at his command. In southern India, there's an individual there by the name of Sai Baba. Now Sai Baba has over 8 million followers in India and outside of India. Over 8 million followers. Believing that he is God incarnate. The avatar, a God-man. Man 
who is God, God becoming a man. And he, when you see him in his various preachings, he is, it's mixed with magical tricks. He will produce golden eggs from his mouth. He has an urn which he will show you, turn it upside down, have people look inside, nothing is inside of it. Then he'll hold it upside down, stick his hand inside, and dust, ashes will come out. People will collect this ash, this is holy ash and magical tricks. And he mesmerizes eight million of his followers. So, though on one hand we can laugh at magic and say it's just tricks and this, that, and the other, but it still, to this day, wins over hearts and minds to disbelief, to worshipping other than Allah. And that is why Islam takes a strong stance against magic. Prophet Muhammad had instructed that magicians should be executed. And the companions, Omar ibn al-Khattab and others who came after when Islam spread in the areas that they went, any person who practiced magic didn't stop. Of course they gave them time, they informed them. Stop it. Finished. If they were caught doing it afterwards, they were executed. It was considered that serious an offense that your life would be taken for it. Because it is a fitna for people. It draws people into shirk. It's that serious. Again, where real magic is done, of course, part of magic is what they call slay of hand. As they say, the hand is faster than the eye. The person moves his hand and he brings a little coin for you from behind your ear or whatever. You know. This is palming things up your sleeve, you know, fast hand movements. Your eye can't follow what's going on and they're producing things. These are just basic little tricks. But then there are other elements which go beyond trickery, which become inexplicable, supernatural. And when you enter into the realm of the supernatural, then you are now entering into the world of the jinn. Because they of themselves cannot do anything. They can only do it with the help and the aid of the jinn. So not understanding that world, people would then attribute these powers to them. People would attribute these powers to these individuals. And then do whatever these individuals bid them. The third way in which this world may affect us is through possession. That it is possible for beings, evil beings from the world of the jinn to possess human beings. It is possible. And this is something one should not have any doubt about. Because Prophet Muhammad sallallahu was brought a boy who was suffering fits. And he opened the boy's mouth, blew in his mouth and said, get out enemy of Allah. I am the messenger of Allah. Some narrations, I am a slave of Allah. Get out, enemy of Allah. So, if there was nothing in this boy, Prophet Muhammad Wasallam was playing games on his companions. Waliyada billah. This is real. But it doesn't mean that everybody who has fits is possessed. Because another woman on one occasion came to the Prophet Wasallam and said, Pray to Allah for me that whenever that I, that fits, uh, she was experiencing fits, she would fall down and shaking and all these kind of things. And her clothing would shift and expose her aura. She asked, O Messenger of Allah, pray to Allah to remove this from me. He said, I can pray to Allah 
for a miracle to remove it from you. Or you can be patient with it and Allah will give you paradise. She said, I'll be patient with it. But, please pray to Allah that at least when I fall down in the fits, my aura is not exposed. My private parts, my garment would not expose me before people. So the Prophet ﷺ prayed for her. If it were a case of possession, then Prophet Muhammad ﷺ would just have told the possessing entity to leave, as he did in the case of the boy. But he didn't. So our Muslim scholars have identified this is a case of biological origin to this illness. It's an illness. It may have similar outward symptoms to possession. Possession may share this. So we understand that not every case, so not every time, you know, you find your child acting strangely, it's, ah, a jinn has got him. No. We don't go there, you know. People act in different ways for a variety of different reasons. We need to understand our children. Not try to explain, you know, from outwards, it's somebody, it's somebody else's fault. It's the world of the jinn. They've taken over my son. This is a mistake. So, basically, as I said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger have spoken about this world and given us information concerning it in order to protect our faith from being threatened by this world and the things that can happen as a result of it. Things which are connected with what we consider to be supernatural, powers, be, etc. Knowledge, which seems to be knowledge of the unseen. We need to have a clear picture of that world. And that is what Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu gave us. أقول قولي هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم ورسائل المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروا إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. I say that asking Allah to forgive myself. I call on you all to turn to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and seek forgiveness from Him because none can forgive sins besides Him. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. Knowledge of this world. The world of the jinn and how it affects us. Is knowledge which should create in us what we call a cautious character. We have a character in which we are cautious about things. The information that we hear, things that are given to us, things that we might see. We don't just take them on face value. We try to understand what may be behind them. That caution is very, very important because we spoke before, you know, as the Prophet Sallallahu had said, "At-ta'anni min Allah." Deliberation in our actions is from Allah. Well, ajala min shaitan and haste is from Satan. So, making a hasty decision, somebody says, "So and so, ah, oh, that's what it is." You, believing in things just automatically, somebody is no. You have to weigh it. We have to question it. Is this thing? from what Islam has recognized and accepted, etc.? Or is this something from the evil world, the unseen world to us? And this is something, in fact, we have in our communities today. Because people say, well, why bother to talk about this stuff? This is from a long time ago. In our communities today, in Muslim communities today, we have witch doctors. We have people who are playing with magic and fortune telling and all these different things. They give them different names. In Indonesian that they called it Bomo. You know. In India they may give it another name and Sri Lanka they give it another name. Different countries give it different names. But in the end when you analyze what's going on, this is from the forbidden world. It is people involved either with the jinn or trying to involve themselves with the jinn. And it's something evil we need to stay away from. If you hear somebody say, in our village we have somebody, if you lose anything, he can tell you where it is. He's a good man. He's got a big beard. But if you lost anything, he can tell you exactly where to find it. Now, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't do that. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not tell people where to find things. 
He himself forgot things. So believe that if anybody is promising you that, that they're doing this, that this is evil. No matter how externally it might appear good. May have a big beard, may read Quran, he may do salah, long prayers, everything. You say, this is a holy man. But you don't know what is in the hearts. As Allah said, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يُعْجِبَكَ قَوْلُهُ فِي الْحَيَاةِ الدُّنْيَا There's amongst the people in this world who will amaze you with what they say. وَيُشْهِدُ اللَّهُ عَلَى مَا فِي قَلْبِ And he swear by Allah about what is in his heart. The faith, iman. وَهُوَ أَلَدُّ الْخِصَامِ And he is the most evil of enemies. So beware. Externally, you cannot judge what is in the heart. We have to judge the actions. Shaykh ibn Taymiyyah, Allah yarhamu, wrote a book called Al-Furqan Bayna Awliya Rahman wa Awliya Shaytan The distinction between the friends, the close friends of the beneficent of Allah and the close friends of Satan. Because there may be supernatural things attributed to both. And you, just looking externally, will mix up the two. When in reality, one is evil and the other is good. So in the end, we have to weigh whatever we hear, whatever we see, we have to weigh it in accordance with the Quran and the Sunnah. Take it back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Was he doing that? Did his companions do that? If they weren't doing it, they weren't saying it, they weren't practicing it in this area, then know that it is not from Islam. That it is from an evil way, an evil world. And there is grave danger in it. If you stop and think, why is it that the followers of Prophet Moses, after crossing the Red Sea, Prophet Musa hits the wet waters and they separate and they go across and the armies of Pharaoh are coming after and the waters come and take them away. And after all of that, they prostrated before a golden calf. How? After you've seen all of that, how can you end up prostrating before a golden calf? Allah explains in the Quran, an individual amongst them who he called a Samiri, he told them to melt down their jewelry and he picked up what he said was some dust from the footprint of an angel, probably of the footprint of a devil, and throws it in the mix and after that, he brings out the calf. Now, when he brought the calf, and he told them, Moses is going to the top of the mountain to worship this God here. I brought it for you. He's going to the top of the mountain, but here it is right here. Shortcut. You don't need to go to the top of the mountain. I have it here for you right here. People, of course, doubted him. You think they didn't just say, okay, yeah, that must be the God of Moses prostrate. No. When they stood before it with their own doubts, then the cow, the calf said, Moo. When they saw that, they prostrated. When they saw that, they prostrated. Because a calf which you make from your own hands is not going to do that. Of course, today we have technology and, you know, we could all easily do it. It's not a big problem, right? But in those days, we're talking about 10,000 years ago, there was no way. There was no way. And that convinced the people, the followers of Moses, who had seen the miracles of Prophet Moses to worship an idol. Is that not dangerous? Is that not a dangerous world that we should know about? Of course. And this is why Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu himself was affected by magic. Some people say, no, no, he wasn't. Couldn't have been. Not possible. 
but in the narrations in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, unanimously held as the most authentic text after the Quran, we have a description of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, being affected by magic. Of course, Allah could have stopped it. So it would not affect him. He could have. But Allah allowed it to affect him. Then sent angels to inform him of the source of what he was suffering from. Where he would start to forget things. He thought he did it, but he hadn't done it. He thought he hadn't done it, and he had done it. Some things which were far away appeared close. Some things were close appeared far away. It affected him in this way. Angels came and informed him. And Allah revealed for him the last two chapters of the Quran, قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ الْفَلَقِ and قُلْ أَعُوذُ بِرَبِّ النَّاسِ When he got the information of who had done it, an individual by the name of Labib ibn Asam, a Jew, who was practicing magic in Medina, who had made a charm and put it in the bottom of a well, and the Prophet ﷺ awoke, because he had seen the angels came to him in a dream. He told Ali ibn Abi Talib to go and get the charm out of the bottom of the well, bring it back, and recite these last two chapters of the Quran over it, and undo the various knots and ties which were made using his hair, etc. And when they finished doing it, when Ali ibn Abi Talib finished reciting over him, he got up, as they said, as if he was released from chains. It was the spell was broken. So we know that that world is real. And it means then that no matter how righteous you can be, you can't say, oh, this only happens to unrighteous people. Just the people who believe in it are affected by it. This is materialists among us may say that. You know, magic only affects those who believe in it. Those who don't believe in it, it doesn't affect them. See, it's always in the third world. In the first world, you don't see it happening all the time. But in the third world, you hear about it all the time. They believe in it. In the first world, they're secularists. They don't believe in God. They don't believe in any of the supernatural stuff. So it doesn't affect them. This is what they say. But actually, if you go into the first world, you will see its effects. It's happening. It's real. It may not be as obvious or in the same forms as it takes in the third world, but it's happening there also. And the Prophet Sallallahu experience is evidence for us. How he dealt with it and he taught how to treat it. And there's a body of material that he left behind for us to be able to treat illnesses of this type. And we recite Quran over those people who suffer, whether physical or spiritual ailments, we recite Quran over them. And this process of reciting is known as ruqya, or we make dua over them in the same way. This is called ruqya. We should be aware of this. Prophet ﷺ has taught us a body of material. Get what is authentic, learn it, and use it. The Prophet ﷺ passed it on for us to benefit from. Do not depend on what is going on back home in the village, in the town, whatever, amongst various people who claim to be able to do this, that, and the other. And you know, you feel shaky about these things. They're asking you to do this, go to the graveyard, dig this up, cut the neck of a chicken, spill the blood on this grave. Be, beware. Beware. And Prophet Muhammad ﷺ was the example for us. And that's why Allah had us praise, ask, seek his praise, uh, praise for him, ask Allah to bless him and to praise him, saying, In Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi, ya ayu alladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. We ask Allah's blessings on Prophet Muhammad ﷺ. We ask Allah to forgive us for our sins. We ask Allah to give us the clarity in religion which would protect our faith and to keep us on the straight path. We ask Allah to strengthen our faith and to spread this faith, to give us the courage to spread the faith to those around us who have not experienced the faith. We ask Allah to keep us in this faith until the last breath that we make in this world and to die as believers.